Hey guys, this week's purchase is this HP Pavilion 14. You may remember we did one of these before on the channel. Uh, there's a common fault with this range of laptops. Um, I just wondering if you can remember what it is. Well, if you can't, the video's still up there and you can check it out. But I'm not going to assume that it's the same issue with this one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try and power on and see what happens. So let's do that now. So I press the power button. Okay, so we have a light. I can hear the fan spinning up. And that's about as far as we get. I've done this a couple of times just to make sure that it's not, you know, waiting for something. But that's what happens. It powers on, but it never shows a display. Let's take out the motherboard and have a look at it on screen. And this is what our motherboard looks like. Now, as you saw from the previous section of the video, when I press the power button, the power light comes on and the fan starts spinning. So I reckon all of the input section voltages are all fine. However, I'm just going to confirm them anyway. So let's start at the start with the DC input jack, which is over here. Our DC input jack connects to this connector on the motherboard right here, and it looks like this. So as you can see, when it connects in, we have two red wires here and two black wires. So this is our positive DC input and this is our ground. Now if you look in really close here you can see these two pins and if you follow that track it comes in underneath the DC connector, underneath this connector right here, across this path and onto a MOSFET here. Let's mark that in. So what we need to confirm to start with is that we're getting our 19.5 volts all along this track here. So to measure that we're getting the correct adapter voltage onto the motherboard, I introduce my multimeter in volts DC, I place my black probe to ground, I place my red probe to the input pin right here, and I find that it measures 19.60 volts. So we're getting the correct voltage onto the board. And following along that track, we should find that same 19.6 volts at the drain pins of this MOSFET. So I place my probe to the drain pin of the MOSFET and I find that it also measures 19.6 volts. I found a data sheet for this first MOSFET and this is it here. So it's an N-channel logic level enhancement mode field effect transistor. As we can see we have a pin configuration here. So we have four drain pins on one side, we have a gate pin and three source pins on either side. Now this one is actually switched around the other way. But if I mark in the pins, what you can see is we have four drain pins here, we have a gate pin and three source pins on the other side. We've confirmed that we have 19.6 volts coming in on our drain pins. So what I would be expecting is that we would have a gate voltage of something like 24 or 25 volts. That switches on this MOSFET and that will allow our 19.6 volts through from our drain to our source. So with my multimeter once again in volts DC in a 20 volt range, I place my black probe to ground and I place my red probe to the gate pin of that first MOSFET and I find that it measures 24.20 volts. So that's a high signal and that should mean that our MOSFET is switched on. And measuring at the source pins of that first MOSFET, I find that there's 19.6 volts there. So our 19.6 volts is making it through our first MOSFET, so we're all good up to this point. So after coming through that first MOSFET, it now travels on to a second MOSFET. So let's find a data sheet for that and see how that works. This is the data sheet for the second MOSFET. As you can see, it is also a 30 volt N channel MOSFET. And the pin configuration is the same as the first MOSFET. So we have four drain pins on one side, three source pins and a gate pin on the other side. These components are actually very small. So I'm gonna zoom in a little here so we can see everything in a little bit more detail. I've zoomed right in here so we can see the pins on that second MOSFET. So as we saw in the schematic, we have four drain pins on one side, a gate pin and three source pins on either side. Now we've confirmed that we have 19.6 volts coming onto the source pins of the second MOSFET. So this operates similarly to the first MOSFET in that we should expect to find about 24, 25 volts on the gate pin. That switches this MOSFET on and that should allow our 19.6 volts through from our source pins to our drain pin. So what I want to check first is see what our gate voltage is. So once again measuring in volts DC, I place my black probe to ground, my red probe to the gate pin of that second MOSFET and I find that it measures 24.40 volts. So that should be high enough voltage to switch that MOSFET on and we should hopefully be finding 19.6 volts on our drain pins. And measuring at the drain pins of that second MOSFET I confirm that there is 19.6 volts there. 
So all looks good up to this point. Now from here that 19.6 volts should go through our current sense resistor and out to the rest of the secondary circuits. So now that we've confirmed that our 19.6 volt power rail is being sent down to all of our secondary circuits, what do we need to check next? Well, what I would normally check next is for our 3.3 volts always on power. I don't have a schematic for this, but I'm sure we can find it here somewhere. So how can we find out which IC produces the 3.3 volts always on power when we do not have a schematic? Well, what do we know? We know that this IC is going to have 19 volts on its input and 3.3 volts on one of its outputs, even when the power is switched off. So with the power switched off, I checked around the ICs on the board, and what I found was that even with the power off, this IC right here, when I measured on this capacitor, I found that there was 3.34 volts on this. So just in case anybody has this motherboard but may have a different fault and is curious to see where the 3.3 volts always on power is generated, well this is the IC that produces it. And what you'll find is when the laptop is powered on it actually produces a high current 3.3 volts on this output also and you can measure that at this inductor. So having confirmed that our 3.3 volts always on power is present, what do I need to check next? Well, I need to check that that 3.3 volts always on power is making it to our Super I.O. This Super I.O. has 128 pins on it. So we can't just go around and check all of them individually. So what I need to do is I need to work out which pins I need to check and then carefully check them for voltage. So even though I don't have a schematic for this laptop, I'm sure we can find a schematic for another laptop that uses this IC or we might be able to find a data sheet for it to tell me what all the pins are for. So let's try and do that. Thanks to some help from badcaps.net I was able to find a schematic of a laptop that has this same Super I.O. So you can see it here, IT5570. I've just chopped out the section of it and put it on the screen here. So what you'll see is at the top we have VSTBY, so voltage standby I presume is what they mean with that. And as you can see it comes in on pins 26, 50, 92, 114, 121 and 127. So we should be able to check any of those pins and we should be finding 3.3 volts. Let me mark those pins out first. I also noticed from the schematic that we have on pin 110 here, power underscore switch. So that's where the power switch signal comes in, so let's mark that in as well. And on pin 35, we have EC underscore RSM reset. I just cut that off a bit too much there, but that's the EC RSM reset signal, so let's mark that in also. That's all we need from our schematic from for the moment. So let's get rid of the schematic off the screen and introduce our multimeter to take some measurements again. So with our multimeter in volts DC once again, I place my black probe to ground and my red probe to pin 127 up here. You can see they're very, very tight to connect to, but I have very thin probes that I use to do this. And when I place it to that, I find that it measures 3.30 volts. So we are getting V standby voltage. Pin 110 is PWR underscore SW hash. Now, this is where our signal from our power button comes on to the Super I.O. to tell it when to switch on and when to switch off. So to emulate the power button, I temporarily grounded this pin with a bit of jumper wire, and I noticed that the fans started spinning. I then jumpered to the ground for a couple of seconds again, and I found that the fans stopped spinning. So I'm confident that the power button switch is actually working and that the Super I.O. is triggering the laptop to come on. The last measurement I took at the Super I.O. was on pin 35, which is the EC underscore RSM reset. With the power off, it was measuring zero volts, and with the power on, I found that it measured 3.34 volts. Now from what I understand about the RSM reset signal, this should only be produced by the Super I.O. when it's gone through a list of checks on startup, including checking the Super I.O. itself and checking the BIOS IC. Do you always check the RSM reset signal from the Super I.O. when you're troubleshooting? Please post down in the comments below if you have anything significant to add.
So where are we in our troubleshooting at this point? Well, we've already established that our 19.6 volt main power rail is online. We've already established that our 3.3 volts always on voltage is present. Uh, the laptop responds to the power button. The power button signal is going to the Super I.O. and the Super I.O. is powering on the laptop. So the next thing I wanted to do was take note of all of the voltages at each of these inductors because the laptop is powering on but we're still not getting any display on the screen and when I took down those voltages these are the voltages that I measured now without having a schematic I can confirm for sure that these voltages are all correct however they look good to me so what I'm gonna do now is focus on the area that I probably should have started with the previous pavilion that I had on the channel had an issue where the pins in the dim socket got loose. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out this dim and we're going to get a closer look at that socket. So having removed my dim, starting with the pin furthest to the right, I just got my tweezers and just probed around the area to see if I could find any loose pins. But as you can see there yourself, there's nothing that I could find that was loose. The last time when I had one of these, I could visually see the pins loose, but it doesn't seem that that's the case with this. Okay, so I checked all of the pins and it didn't seem like there was any bad connections, so I cleaned them down with a toothbrush and just decided to buzz them all out one by one to make sure there was no cross pins or anything like that. And as you can see here, they all checked out perfectly fine. After confirming that all the pins buzzed out perfectly fine, I cleaned out the socket, as you can see here, with a hoover, just to confirm that there was no dirt inside. Okay, so here we are. So just to confirm, all I've really done with this is clean out the pins on the dim socket, hoover out the inside of the socket, clean it down with a toothbrush, and buzz them all out just to make sure that they're all connected. So I'm just gonna press the button and see what happens. Okay, would you believe it? It's working. Okay, so it seems like it is powering on now and it is booting into Windows. So that's all I got for this week, guys. The reason you may have heard me sighing in the last part of the video is because I hate when I don't know 100% what has resolved the problem. This laptop came to me with a sticker saying not powering on, there was no hard drive, there was no memory and a lot of chassis damage around the sides of it. It looks clean from the front on the video but on the side it has taken a lot of a battering. So I've taken out the motherboard obviously, I've checked all the voltages, I've cleaned out the dim socket, put it back together again and I've got it back working but I'm not a hundred percent what the fault was plus that original dim that I put into the motherboard before taking the picture still doesn't work in it I think it's just not compatible with it so I had to try another dim in order to get it booting but look all I can do is take these as they come when it came to me it wasn't booting and now it is booting um, please like and subscribe and if you have any comments for me please put them down in the comment section below